Hi everyone. In this experiment, we are going to look at uh, which is a better deicer. And we have two choices. We have NaCl and we have CaCl2. Now, we are not going to consider some practically uh, practical applications like uh, price, availability, uh, things like this, uh, toxicity to the environment. We are going to look at more of this from a theoretical perspective. And the theoretical perspective that we're going to look at is two aspects. We're going to look at the heat of solution because when you dissolve um, some of these compounds, the, the, um, the, as they break up into their ions, they give off heat. Said another way, dissolving them is exothermic. Well, that is obviously beneficial if your goal is to melt ice. So when you dissolve NaCl, you get Na plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. And when we dissolve calcium chloride, we get Ca2 plus aqueous plus 2 Cl minus aqueous. So these com ionic compounds dissolve in water and form their ions. Um, if you look it up, you'll find that when you dissolve calcium and chloride in, wa in water, this is exothermic. It gives off heat, which again can be beneficial for melting ice. When NaCl, and as we'll talk about when we talk about the hypothesis a little bit later on, is slightly endothermic. It's so slightly endothermic that it's actually difficult to measure in this experiment, but it is slightly endothermic. So we're going to test these two things uh, to determine which is better. When it comes to heat of solution, we can describe that as delta H of the solution, the enthalpy of the solution, or heat of solution, equals negative M, where M is the mass in grams, times C sub S, which is the specific heat capacity, which is joules per gram degree C, times delta T, which is the change in temperature, and we're going to measure it in Celsius here. It could be measured in Kelvin as well. So this is basically what we're going to calculate for the heat of solution. However, before we get into uh, actually calculating the heat of solution, which Tim's going to show you how to do in just a minute here, and then we'll do the calculations on Excel, what we're going to actually do is have you do a semi-qualitative test where you simply take half a gram of NaCl and add, add it to three grams of ice and half of a gram of CaCl2 and add it separately to three grams of ice and see which melts the ice more quickly. Although this is not a definitive test, this test will give you a kind of a rough idea of which one of these two salts may be a better deicer. Then we'll move on to actually experimentally finding the heat of solution as uh, Tim is going to show you in just a minute, where we're going to use half of a gram of these salts and we're going to know ex the exact mass and we're going to use around five grams of water and again we're going to know the exact mass and then we could find the enthalpy of solution. There's one final note that I'd like to make before we show you this experiment, the first experimental part, and that is the specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacities are generally for solvents, and here we're going to have a solution. Now we could actually measure the specific heat capacity of this solution, but instead of doing that, we're going to assume that the specific heat, the heat capacity of the total solution is the same as the specific heat of capacity of water. This approximation is relatively accurate, and furthermore, it is much easier than trying to measure the actual specific heat capacity. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tim, and he's going to show you how to do the experiment. Hi, everyone. So when Colin and I initially made this video, we had a strategy for this that we eventually determined was not the best strategy. Uh, just like anyone else, we can always improve our work and come up with better ideas later on, and that's what happened here. So we've found a better way to do this portion of the experiment. So if you notice there's a disjointed uh, cut between the background or some of the things we cover, uh, I apologize for that, but it's important to know that we still cover everything you need to know for the experiment. So we're going to move on to the experimental portion of this part of the experiment. So what do we need to do? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to open up. So we're going to open up our microlab shortcut here on our desktop. We'll see our little blue bar that lets us know my lab is working correctly and we will get our microlab to open. So, for this experiment, we need to open a microlab experiment, so you can double click that or click OK, and it'll bring up our familiar microlab screen. For this experiment, we need to add two sensors to our microlab. The first sensor that we need to add is a temperature sensor. In our labs, we use a thermistor, so we're going 
use the temperature thermistor, and then we're going to click which input we have our thermistor plugged into. I have it plugged into input A, so I'm going to click on the little box for A, and I'm going to tell it to use the factory calibration. Now we have our thermistor, which tells us it's about 24.3 degrees in the lab right now, which I actually have pinned underneath something. Um, but it tells us it's, you know, about 24 and a half degrees in the room. So I need to add a second sensor. The second sensor I need to add is time, because we want to measure the change of temperature over time. So I'm going to add my second sensor as a time sensor. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to click on time, and then I need to click on one of my three numbers for my timer. So I'm going to click number one, and then I'm going to choose to set my timer options. Everything is how I want it to be. I want it to measure in seconds, and I want it to start at zero when I hit start the experiment. So I'm going to click finish. Now I need to set up my reliable view my data as it changes over time. So I'm going to take my time probe, I'm going to click and drag it to my x-axis for data source one. And I'm going to click and drag my thermistor to the y-axis for data set two. So now what's going to happen is when I click on start down here, the uh, microlab is going to start recording data of temperature versus time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up uh, picture in picture for a second just to show you my setup, and then I'm going to make it go away and bring it back again. So I'm going to have my thermistor here, which uh, is over here, and I'm going to put it into this beaker with a test tube containing water. So I've already measured five grams of water into this test tube, which is what I'm going to use to perform my experiment. I also have in this test tube, held by a three-pound clamp on a ring stand, are 0.5 grams of calcium chloride. In this video, I'm only going to do this with calcium chloride, but in the lab, you're going to do this with both calcium and sodium chloride. So the temperature that I'm concerned with is the temperature of my water solution. So that's what I need to measure. So to start, I'm going to put my thermistor into my test tube of water. Now, the reason I have a test tube and a beaker here is because that's how I measure my masses of water and calcium chloride. I put an empty test tube in a beaker, put that beaker and test tube on the balance, I press to tear, and then I added five grams of water to this one, and I added 0.5 grams of calcium chloride to this one. So now, before I put my thermistor in there, I'm gonna come back to my micro lab, which is gonna make my picture disappear for a second, and I'm gonna click start. Now, you'll notice that points start appearing on the graph. We're not concerned with those points because they're not the points we want. So I'm gonna take my thermistor and I'm gonna put it into my water in my test tube. And I'm gonna give it a second for the temperature to adjust to the temperature of my water in case it's uh, substantially different than that of the room. This water's been sitting out in the room for a few minutes, so it's pretty likely that it's relatively close to room temperature water. So we have a baseline set up for our thermistor uh, for the temperature of our water. Now, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to describe it before I do it, because once I do it, I need to do it fairly quickly, is I'm going to take my thermistor out of my water, I'm going to take my test tube of water, and I'm going to pour it into my test tube containing calcium chloride. As soon as I pour the water in and put my test tube down, I'm going to take the thermistor and this glass stirring rod, and I'm going to put them both in here and stir vigorously. The reason I want to stir is I want to make sure all of my calcium chloride is dissolving as quickly as possible to get my biggest change in my temperature, which I'll measure as the heat of solution for this experiment. So that's what I'm going to do, and that's what I'm going to do in a second. But I want you to note that when I take my thermistor out of the water here, the temperature may change. And if it does, we're just going to ignore those points on our graph. So I'm going to take my thermistor out, pour my water in, and stir vigorously. So bear with me for a second while I do that. I am prepared uh, ahead of time. I can even put my thermistor in ahead of time if I'd like. And then I'm going to pour my water in and I'm going to stir vigorously. And you'll see that my temperature is spiked up. And that's it for this portion of the experiment. We've done everything we need to. As you can see, our temperature is starting to come back down. And eventually, if we gave it enough time, that temperature would come all the way back down to being the same temperature as our initial. So I'm going to close out of that for the camera for a second so that you can see this graph, and I'm going to click stop. Now my data's been saved. So I have here three different portions of data. I have when I, the thermistor was in the water before I performed the experiment, 
I have when I took the thermistor out of the water, and I have when I performed the experiment. So I want to measure the change in temperature that resulted as a result of dissolving the calcium chloride in the water. So the two points I need are my pre-calcium chloride temperature and my peak temperature that the solution made it to. So to find those, I'm going to hover my mouse over one of the points in the graph prior to taking it out of the water, and I'll see that it says thermistor is, well, it went away again, but it was 24.49. And if I hover over again, it will show back up 24.44 on this point. So I have my initial temperature is 24.44 degrees. For my final temperature, I'm going to hover over my highest point on my graph and wait for it to show up again, and I see that my highest temperature is 28.87. So my change in temperature is from 24.44 to 28.87 degrees. Excuse me. So I have a change in temperature of about 4.4 degrees, and I'll show you in a minute in Excel how to use Excel to figure out how to solve for your heat of solution using that information. But before I do that, there's one more thing I want to show you. So if I bring back up my camera here, I want to show you how to make an ice salt bath. So in your lab manual, it tells you that when you make an ice salt bath, you'll want to let it sit for about 10 minutes. And the reason for this is just because you need to wait for it to get cold. If I were to just put ice, which I have back here, into my thermos, it's not going to be colder than ice. And considering we're at the point of this is to measure freezing point depression, we can assume that our solutions will freeze lower temperatures than regular water, which means that ice, which is the temperature of frozen water, will not be cold enough to freeze our solution. So we need to make it colder by making an ice salt bath. So to make an ice salt bath, I'm going to take some ice and I'm going to put it into my thermos. If you get a little bit on the bench, don't worry about it. Just make sure you clean up afterwards. Once I do that, I'm going to take my salt and I'm going to add just a layer of salt on top of that. You don't want to use a ton of salt, but you also want to use a healthy enough amount to make sure there's a good amount of salt in there. Next, I'm going to add another uh, layer of ice on top of that. I'm going to add just a little bit more. And now I have a layer of ice, a layer of salt, and a layer of ice. Now I'm going to take this test tube and I'm going to put it into my solution, or rather my ice bath. And the reason I'm putting it in now is because the ice salt bath is going to get very hard by the end of this. And once it's hard, it's going to be very difficult to make a spot for the test tube that we need uh, at the end of the experiment. So I'm going to put it in now so that the uh, solution, or rather the ice bath, freezes with a hole made for the test tube. So once I put that in, I'm going to add another layer of salt. And then I'm going to add another layer of ice around it. Once you've got the test tube in, it gets a little harder to do because you need to make sure you're spreading everything around the test tube so that you're not just building it up on one side. But now I've got a layer of ice, a layer of salt, another layer of ice, another layer of salt, and a third layer of ice. So I'm just going to add one more layer on top just to be sure that I'm getting a nice, good ice salt bath. If you spill some salt on the bench while you're doing this, please make sure you clean it up. We don't want to come into the labs and find that there's a bunch of salt all over the place. That's how we get sticky uh, benches and dirty benches, and we don't want that. So, I've added three separate layers of ice and salt to my ice salt bath, and I have a test tube in there to make sure that the space remains for a test tube later on. Now I'm going to just put that aside while I do the rest of the experiment until I need it so that my ice salt bath has time to get nice and cold. Now I'll go over to Excel and show you how to uh, analyze the data we got from the heat of solution portion of the experiment. I do just want to reiterate, however, that the data shown in this portion of the experiment with my two numbers will not necessarily match the data in the third part of the experiment where I cover the data. Again, that's because we're reperforming this part because we found a better way to mix our salt and our water than we had previously shown. So if the data doesn't line up perfectly, don't worry about it. It's still perfectly good data and will still work for the experiment. So once we have our data ready, we can actually go ahead into Excel and do the calculations we need to in order to calculate our heat of solution. You'll see here I have in my Excel file a well-labeled 
area for my heat of solution calculations, and a well-labeled area for my experimental Van Hoff factor, which we'll do cover later in this video. For now, we'll focus on the heat of solution. So we're actually, when you perform this in lab, you're going to have two sets of data, one for calcium chloride and one for sodium chloride. At this point, uh, we're only going to perform the calculations for the calcium chloride portion of the experiment. So for the mass of water, we need to uh, write or put in what we recorded earlier uh, when we massed out our water before we started filming, and we had 5.0962 grams of water. And for our salt, which we wanted around a half a gram, we had 0 0.4926 grams of salt. Now, you'll notice that even though we want 5 grams of water and a half a gram of salt, we didn't get exactly those numbers, and that's okay. The important thing is that we're around those numbers, not that we get exactly those numbers. So our uh, 0.4926 and 5.0962 will work just fine. Now, in order to calculate the heat of solution, we need to calculate the M, the CS, and the DT for the experiment. So the M is our mass of solution. The solution is equal to the mass of our solute plus the mass of our solvent. So I'm going to take the mass of our solute, and I'm going to add the mass of our solvent, and hit enter. And it'll tell me that the mass of our solution was 5.5888 grams. Next, we need to write the specific heat of water. Uh, in this case, as Colin said earlier, um, normally the specific heat is for the actual system, but in this case, because we're using a lot of water and very little salt, we're going to go ahead and assume that the specific heat of our solution is roughly equal to the specific heat of water. So we're going to type in 4.18 as our specific heat of our water. Next, we need to enter in our temperature data from uh, earlier. So our initial temperature on Microlab, if you'll remember, was 27.38 degrees Celsius, and our final temperature was 33.52 degrees Celsius. And again, those numbers came straight from the Microlab when we performed that portion of the experiment. So now to calculate our change in temperature, uh, deltas are always calculated as final minus initial. So we take our final temperature and subtract our initial temperature, and we find that the delta T for our experiment was 6.14 degrees Celsius. So now we have everything we need to calculate the heat of solution. So if you'll remember, our heat of solution is negative mass of solution times specific heat times change in temperature. So we need to do the negative, which for that in Excel, we're just going to do negative 1 times the mass of our solution. We're going to multiply that by the specific heat of water, and we multiply that by our change in temperature. Once we've selected all of our data, we hit enter, and we find that our heat of solution in joules in this case was negative 143.438. Now, however, the lab manual asks that we calculate this value not just in joules, but in kilojoules per mole. So we need to take this number and convert it from joules to kilojoules per mole. So to do that, the first thing we need to figure out is how many moles of solution we have. You'll notice the two numbers I had filled out before I performed the experiment are the molar masses of calcium chloride and sodium chloride respectively. So the molar mass of calcium chloride is 110.98. So in order to convert from grams to moles so that we can perform this calculation, we need to take our grams of calcium chloride and divide that by the molar mass of calcium chloride. And we'll see that we have 0 0.004439 moles of calcium chloride. Now to convert from joules to kilojoules per mole, the first thing we have to do is convert from joules to kilojoules, so we need to divide the number of joules by a thousand. And the second thing we need to do is we need to make it in per mole, so we'll divide that number by the number of moles of calcium chloride we have in this solution. We'll hit enter and find that our heat of solution in kilojoules per mole is negative 32.3157. So that's all the data that we need to calculate for the first uh, experimental portion of the experiment. Of course, when you perform this, you'll have to do these same calculations for the sodium chloride, but once you've entered in your data for the mass of water, the mass of salt, and your initial and final temperature, you can just drag over all of these calculations because it's set up so that all of those calculations will be performed exactly the same way. Next, we'll move on to talking about and showing you how to do the experimental Van Hoff factor portion of the experiment. The last thing I want to tell you before we move on to that is uh, a couple of different things. So first of all, the heat of solution of the sodium chloride 
could be very, very small. It would not be uh, surprising for it to be close to zero. If the change in temperature is close to zero, uh, that's what will cause that. So if that does happen to you in lab, then you probably did not make a mistake. That is just true for this experiment. I also want to point out, just as a sanity check for the calcium chloride, uh, when Colin was talking before, he pointed out that the calcium chloride is exothermic, so we would expect it to give off heat, and we notice that the heated solution is negative, which indicates that our calcium chloride was in fact exothermic. The third and final thing I want to remind you of before we move on to the experimental Van Hoff factor portion of the experiment is that you need to keep your solutions from this portion of the experiment. So right now you should have, once you've done this portion of the experiment, a test tube with water and calcium chloride and a test tube with water and sodium chloride. Those test tubes need to be kept because we're going to freeze them for the next portion of the experiment uh, in order to calculate the experimental Van Hoff factor. So make sure that you don't get rid of those solutions. Make sure you keep them and have them on hand so that you can use them for the final part of the experiment. So in the first part of this experiment, we found that the heat of solution uh, for calcium chloride was exothermic. And in the second part of the experiment, what we're going to do is we're going to freeze that exact same solution. So what we want to uh, look at here is the freezing point depression. So the reason that they put salt on the roads in the wintertime is because the freezing point of the solution, salt water, is lower than the freezing point of pure water. So in the United States, we use Fahrenheit as our temperature um, readings, and 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the freezing point of water. If you put salt on the roads, you could have uh, a temperature of, say, you know, 22 or even 15 degrees Fahrenheit outside, and the um, snow or the ice on the roads will still melt. So that's what we want to look at here. Freezing point depression is a colligative property. And colligative properties are properties that are dependent on the um, amount of substance in the solution, but not on the identity of that substance. So the expression that describes this is delta T equals I times KF times M. And I'm not going to go into great detail about colligative properties or the freezing point depression constant uh, ex expression here, but I do want to show you the fundamentals of it and how we use it. So I is the Vant Hoff factor. And this is essentially the number of ions that form in solution. So earlier we talked about sodium chloride breaking up into sodium ions and chloride ions. Each of these ions, because freezing point depression is a colligative property, is capable of depressing the freezing point. So since there are two ions in solution, the Vant Hoff factor here is two. For calcium chloride, it actually breaks up into three ions in solution, the calcium two plus ion and two chloride ions. This is a total of one, two, three ions. So the Van Hoff factor here, theoretically, is three. Kf is the freezing point depression constant, which is 1.86 degrees C per molal for water. And then finally, M, is the molality and molality is the moles of solute divided by kilograms of solvent so this is a unit of concentration you may be familiar with molarity which is moles of solute per liter of solution but molality is not temperature dependent since molarity takes into account volume it uh, the volume will change with changing temperature Hotter solutions have a higher volume than colder solutions. But when we use mass, which is the amount of matter in a substance, essentially, the, it is not affected by temperature. So molality is a unit of concentration that is important for temperature studies because, again, it's not actually affected by the temperature. In this experiment, we're going to experimentally determine the Van Hoff factor by rearranging this equation. So we're simply going to divide by uh, Kf over M, divide by Kf over M, not Kf over M, divide by Kf times M, divide by Kf by, times M, and we find that I equals delta Tf over Kf M. We're going to find the experimental value of the Van Hoff factor for both sodium chloride and calcium chloride. 
we're then going to use that experimental Van Hoff factor to find out um, how much sodium or calcium chloride would need to be added to one kilogram of water to lower its temperature to minus 9.6 degrees Celsius. And the reason we chose minus 9.6 degrees Celsius is that is the lowest average low for any month um, here in Albany. It's actually minus 9.7 degrees Celsius. I just looked that up quick. Um, anyway, so what we're going to do now is uh, Tim is going to uh, use that ice bath that he made. It's been sitting for 10 minutes, um, so it's ready to go. And then he's going to actually freeze the solution. I want to let you know ahead of time that these experimental results that you're seeing in this video, we're actually doing this as we're uh, recording the video, and these are our experimental results. They may not be perfect, okay but they are what we are getting um, there are lots of reasons for that and we'll talk about that a little bit after uh, when you see the results so now that colin's gone through the theoretical portion of this part of the experiment i'm going to show you physically what you're going to do in the lab so you can see here my ice bath that i set up earlier in the video and my test tube that i have holding space as well as my test tube from the first portion of the experiment which still has my same calcium chloride solution in water so I've already got my microlab set up. It's set up the exact same way as the first portion of the experiment with a thermistor on the y-axis and time on the x-axis recording every 0.5 seconds. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my placeholder test tube out of my ice bath. I'm going to free up my regular test tube with my calcium chloride in it. I'm going to put it into my ice bath and I'm going to click start. Once I click start, what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start stirring the solution with a glass stirring rod. It's important that you stir the solution because you need the entire solution to be the same temperature. By stirring it, I'm ensuring that each part moves around so that each part of it is uh, thoroughly mixed and remains uniformly temperatured. This portion of the experiment will require you to do this for several minutes. It's important that you continue to do it nonstop. You may need to switch hands or have a partner take over for you if your arm gets tired, but you can't stop and you need to be careful not to do it too hard as you can break the test tube uh, at the bottom, which will spill your solution into the ice bath. If you do that, you will cause your results to be useless because you don't have a solution anymore. So here you can see the temperature of the solution is decreasing rapidly. We're already down to around 6 degrees. And what we're looking for is one of two things to happen. The first thing is that the temperature gets down below zero and eventually levels out and doesn't continue to change. Uh, if that happens and we notice that the solution has frozen solid, then our experiment is done and we've obtained results for our experiment. The other thing that can happen is what is called supercooling. So if our temperature of our solution decreases and decreases beyond the freezing point of the solution, because the entire thing hasn't quite gotten cold enough yet, and then suddenly jumps back up uh, to a warmer temperature, the warmer temperature that it jumps up to is in fact our actual freezing point. The freezing point is not the lowest point on the graph, it's just the point at which the temperature becomes consistent. So you'll notice just there, my temperature jumped back up and is continuing back down. That was not super cooling. That was just me pulling the thermistor out of the solution a little bit. <laughs> so don't be confused by your own uh, dexterity mistakes while you're performing the experiment. But you'll notice that my solution has continued to get colder and is now approaching negative four degrees. And we're just waiting to see either this number to level off or for supercooling to occur. The supercooling will look similar to that lump we saw earlier in the experiment, but the temperature won't continue to go back down again afterwards. So here, I'm just going to continue to stir my solution while I wait for it to either freeze or the supercooling to occur. You can see here, our temperature is jumping up and not going back down again afterwards, and I have not accidentally removed the thermistor from the solution this time. So this is the supercooling I was talking about. When that happens, you can stop stirring your uh, test tube and you can stop your experiment.
So once you've stopped your experiment, you, the only value you're going to need is the new freezing point for your solution. So as I said before, we don't want to use this bottom temperature here. We want to use where it levels out to afterwards. So if I hold my mouse up here, I'll see that the new freezing point is negative 2.96 degrees Celsius. And that's the temperature that I'm going to use in order to calculate my experimental Van Hoff factor and figure out how much salt is needed to lower the freezing point of a kilogram of water down to negative 9.6 degrees. So I'll pick back up on this portion of the experiment uh, once we've got Excel open and we're ready to go through the data. So now that we have Excel set up, we're going to go ahead and we can show you how to perform the calculations for this portion of the experiment. Before I do that, I wanted to show you one more thing with our solution. If I take my solution out, you can see here if I tilt it sideways, it's not moving. The reason it's not moving is because my solution froze. The whole point of this portion of the experiment is to measure the freezing point of the solution, so when you are done measuring the freezing point, it should of course be frozen. So now I'm going to close out of my camera, and we're going to go over the experimental Van Hoff factor calculation. So the only point of data we have from this portion of the experiment is the freezing point that we have uh, changed to. So in this case, our freezing point has become negative 2.96 degrees Celsius, which is our new freezing point of our solution. In order to calculate the uh, experimental Van Hoff factor, the points we need are the freezing point of the solution, Kf, and the molality of the solution. So we have the freezing point. Next, we need the Kf, which is the freezing point constant of water, which, as Colin said earlier, is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. And the last thing we need to calculate is the molality of the solution. So in the numerator, we need the moles of solute, which luckily we calculated already before. And we need to divide that by the kilograms of solvent. So we take our mass of water, our solvent, and we need to divide it by 1,000 to convert it from grams to kilograms. So now this will calculate our molality for us. So the molality of our solution is around 0.87097. So now we have all of the points that we need to calculate our experimental Van Hoff factor. So we need to take our change in temperature, or change in freezing point, we need to divide it by our freezing point constant times our molality, close our parentheses, and hit enter. Now we see that the experimental Van Hoff factor is negative 1.8. Now, of course, a Van Hoff factor cannot be a negative number. Our Van Hoff factor appears to be negative in this case because uh, the freezing point decreased. So all we need to do to change that is make this number 2.96 instead of negative 2.96, and it'll uh, undo the negative value for our Van Hoff factor. And you can see that our Van Hoff factor in this case is 1.827 or so. Now, of course, for calcium chloride, as Colin said before, the uh, theoretical Van Hoff factor is 3. It's not surprising to not end up with the perfectly correct answer in this portion of the experiment for a couple of different reasons. The first and most obvious reason is all of the calcium chloride did not necessarily get into my solution. Uh, some of it gets stuck on the funnel, some of it gets stuck in the beaker, some of it gets stuck in the side of the test tubes. So rather than having the full 0.4926 grams of salt that we recorded up here, we could have significantly less salt in the solution. Having less salt would, of course, change our values. So it's not necessarily a perfect uh, representation of our Van Hoff factor, but it's a good enough number for this experiment. The purpose of the experiment is to get used to working with these values and understanding the concepts more than it is to getting the exactly correct theoretical answers, as it is in uh, most of the labs you do in this course. So the last thing we need to do is determine the molality needed, and therefore the mass of salt needed, in order to make one kilogram of water reduce its freezing point to negative 9.7 degrees Celsius. So to do that, we're going to go back to our theoretical, or back to our uh, freezing point depression equation, and we're going to make the freezing point change to 9.7. We're going to use our experimental Van Hoff factor and the Kf for water in order to calculate the molality. So to do that, what we'll have is the freezing point depression, 9.7, and we're going to divide that by I times Kf. I, in this case, will be our experimental Van Hoff factor, and we'll multiply it by the Kf, the freezing point 
depression constant of water, which again is 1.86. Uh, we can type 1.86 in, or we could click up here. Either way, it'll work just the same. Now we hit enter and we see that the molality needed for uh, making one kilogram of water reduce its freezing point to 9.7 degrees Celsius, or rather negative 9.7 degrees Celsius, is 2.854192 molal. Now we need to convert from a molality into a mass of salt. So the first thing that we need to do is get rid of our uh, kilograms of solvent. But luckily for us, the uh, question asks us about one kilogram of water. So if we make the kilograms of solvent one, then the moles of solute and the molality will be equivalent. So what we need to do is convert this 2.854 molal uh, which we, in this case, will use as 2.845 moles of solute per one kilogram of water, and we're going to convert those moles into grams. So to do that, we're going to take the moles and multiply it by the molar mass, just like we always do to calculate the uh, mass needed from moles. So in this case, in our one kilogram of water, we need to dissolve over 300 grams of salt in order to uh, reduce the freezing point of a kilogram of water to negative 9.7 degrees Celsius. Now, of course, we uh, said at the beginning of this experiment that we're performing this in order to figure out which of these two salts is better purely from a theoretical standpoint without taking into account things like toxicity or uh, cost. We're just going to perform this experiment with the calcium chloride uh, like we did for you on camera, and then you're going to perform the experiment with the sodium chloride, and you'll be able to see which of them would, be, uh, would require less salt in order to lower the freezing point of water to negative 9.7 degrees Celsius. So ultimately, once you've completed both the calcium chloride and sodium chloride portions of the experiment, you'll be able to make a statement in your uh, report whether you feel that uh, calcium chloride or sodium chloride would be better suited to reducing the temperature of the water to negative 9.7 degrees Celsius so that we could uh, remain unfrozen through even the worst winters in upstate New York. For the last portion of this video, Colin is going to go over the hypothesis uh, of the experiment with you so that you are able to have that uh, ready and prepared for class because as always the most important thing for performing the experiment well and getting uh, good data and being done on time is being as prepared as possible for the lab. So I'll turn it back over to Colin so that he can go over that with you. So the last thing that we're going to do here in this video is probably the first thing that you want to do which is to write the hypothesis for the experiment but i feel like it's better to go over the experiment so we have an idea of what's going on and then write the hypothesis so this is one of the first experiments where you've been asked to write the hypothesis without detailed instructions um, exactly of what should be in each sentence although there are some fairly detailed instructions here um, what we want to do is uh, follow these instructions in order to find um, the information that it asks for. So first, it says a specific pre prediction of what the heat of solution will be for both sodium chloride and calcium chloride. Before I continue, I do want to point out that this mostly focuses on or exclusively focuses on uh, the heat of the solution section, the Van Hoff factor section, you get a break and you don't have to go uh, into detail in the hypothesis. So the first thing we want is a specific uh, prediction for the heat of solution for both sodium chloride and calcium chloride. All I did there was did a Google search. You could use your textbook as well. Calcium chloride heat of solution. And I clicked on the first PDF that came up. And I find that it's minus 82.9 kilojoules per mole. So that's the theoretical value. You'll remember that we got around minus 30, so we were pretty far off, uh, but this is the theoretical value. If we go down a little bit further on the same document, you could find that... Um, that uh, NACL is positive 3.9 kilojoules per mole. So you can find the two heats of solution simply using this document with a Google search. Now, the next thing we want is the change in temperature of the water that will be observed with the addition of both calcium chloride and sodium chloride. This is actually a quite challenging problem to solve. So I want to switch over to the um, to the where I write, and basically you'll see that I have minus 82.9 kilojoules per mole and plus 3.9 kilojoules per mole for NaCl. Now I'm going to do this example for CaCl2, and then you can do for yourself uh, for NaCl. So the first thing I need to do is I need to remember that what I'm going to do is I'm going to add half of a gram of the CaCl2 to five grams of water, and ultimately I want delta H of the solution 
equals negative mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature, like we talked about earlier. The thing is, I'm not adding a whole mole of calcium chloride, right? If I was adding a whole mole, I could just plug in minus 82.9, maybe convert it to joules, and then go from there. But I'm not adding a whole mole. I'm adding half of a gram. So what I need to do first is I need to convert my half a gram of CaCl2 to moles. So 0 0.500 grams of CaCl2 using the molar mass, which is 110.98 grams of CaCl2, and on top one mole of CaCl2. And this gives me um, 0 0.00451 moles of CaCl2. Now that I know how many moles there are, I can convert the kilojoules per mole to kilojoules. You could also do this in one dimensional analysis step if you're easier if it's easier for you by putting minus 82.9 on the top and one mole on the bottom. But I'm going to do it in two steps here. So I'm going to take the 0 0.00451 moles of CaCl2 times I want to put the minus 82.9 kilojoules on the top and the one mole of CaCl2 on the bottom. When I do that math, I get negative 0.374 kilojoules. If you'll recall, our specific heat capacity is joules per uh, gram degree C. So this is in kilojoules, I need it to be in joules. So I'm going to multiply by 1,000 or negative 374 joules. So I just converted it to uh, joules by multiplying by 1,000. Now I can finally plug into this equation and solve. So I start with minus 374 joules, delta H of solution, equals negative mass. Um, in this case, the mass of the solution is 5.5 grams, which is 5 grams of water and half a gram of calcium chloride. The C sub S is 4.18 joules per gram degree C. And the change in temperature in this case is the variable. When I solve this equation, I get delta T equals 16.3 degrees C, which means that the solution should heat up by 16.3 degrees C. When we actually did the experiment, it heated up by about 6.1 degrees C. The possible reasons for this are one, as Tim mentioned, we didn't get all the calcium chloride in there. The other thing is we're not using a very insulated system. So um, you saw how quickly it heated up and we're losing heat to the surroundings constantly. So there are some room, there is some room for improvement here. Going back to the hypothesis, the next thing is the sign associated with the heat of solution of calcium chloride, it's negative, and this makes this process exothermic. So calcium chloride has an exothermic heat of solution with a, positive, or with a negative delta H of solution. And the sign associated with the heat of solution of sodium chloride is positive. And this process is therefore endothermic. So the only thing you're going to need to do is repeat that calculation that I did for cal calcium chloride to answer number two for sodium chloride. One thing I do want to finally point out is if you remember that in this experiment we actually made an ice salt bath. Well the reason that we did that is because NaCl is slightly endothermic as it dissolves. This draws heat out of the solution and therefore cools it down. This is why an ice salt bath um, is cooler uh, than just an ice bath. It's also worth noting, you'll notice that when Tim made that, he used lots of salt and no water. If you add water to an ice salt bath, it makes the sodium chloride less effective at cooling. And if your ice isn't cool enough to uh, freeze your solution, uh, the experiment won't work. So I hope you've enjoyed the video and thank you for watching.